part three of our webinar series. We started with part one, um, which I'm going to send everyone a link here, which was supervision. Uh, engagement practices for supervisors, and then February 2nd, we had our first best practices in adult outpatient mental health services webinar, and now we're having our, our third webinar, but part two of best practices. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kara Dina Sale, and I am joined here by Jason Jones. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be joining you again. Uh, um, just to introduce myself. I'm a social worker here at CTAC. I've been here for about seven months and I'm excited to be working on this project to all of you. My name is Ruth Colon Wagner. I'm also a social worker and I work with the New York Association for Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. And hello everyone. I'm Yvette Kelly and I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I've been working with CTAC now for a couple of months but have experience working in the uh, clinical environment as an outpatient uh, director for Children's Services. Glad you can join us. Thank you, everyone. So as you can tell, I'm here with a wonderful team, uh, and we are all available to you if you have any questions or concerns about today's webinar or the series in general. I wanted to point out that we are ha having this webinar for our learning community um, and as well as a broader CTAC audience. So thanks again for joining us. We're going to go over the agenda uh, really quickly. We're going to talk about our objectives, the engagement process, really reviewing that process that we talked about last time if you were able to join us, review of the engagement at first contact, which is what we talked about last time. Then we're going to go into talking about the meat of our presentation around the engagement at the first few meetings, uh, which is also considered um, those first initial contacts. And then going into ongoing engagement is just as important. We have a little role play with for you today with Ruth and Jason uh, as a continuation of their first role play in the, in the previous webinar. We'll talk about next steps and take any questions or concerns you have. If you'd like to uh, send us any questions or concerns, you can always chat them into the right and we can attend to them as we uh, continue the webinar. So the purpose of the webinar today, we are focusing on adult engagement practice. And now what we're doing is really pushing pause on this process. So this is a really fast process that happens between you, the provider, and the participant who's coming through the door to really seek services. So it usually happens very quickly. And we're, what we're doing is we're really critically thinking about it during our time together. Um, today we're going to focus on engagement skills during the first meetings and retention. How do we really engage our our participants as we continue our work with them. But we're really trying to provide organizations such as yourselves the opportunity to really improve the knowledge and skills of those engagement practices uh, that really meet high standards of quality. Why is this important? Well, for a lot of reasons. One, it's not that easy. You know, it sounds pretty easy and it seems pretty simple, but when you, when, when it comes down to it, so much of, of our participation in our services starts with engagement. And often what happens is if I don't know what kind of organization you're in, but often people come to one or two appointments and they don't come back. So we're, we want to think more about this in the work that we do. We here at CTAC think about this quite often. Uh, we talk about it on a regular basis. We have been working on this particular series for about two years, just so you know, really critically thinking about engagement and how to present it to you in the best way. So we have a bunch of resources for you today, and of course we are here for you if you need anything. Um, so also, um, you know, as we're transitioning to managed care, there's a, a big focus on outcomes and how important outcomes are, and outcomes are directly related to engagement. So if your participants are engaged in services, they're most likely going to get better. So it's really important to think about this process. So let's talk about our best practices. This is the process that we have brought to you, and we have phone-based engagement, which sometimes not always happens at the first contact. Uh, we are aware, as we talked about last time, if you were with us around how many of you have gone into open access, and so your first contact may look, may maybe it used to be a phone call, and now it's a person coming through your door. So the f first phone contact, it could be First contact could be on the phone, and it could also be in person. So we have that in two different places now. Um, Phone-based engagement can also be ongoing phone contact. So this is really important. We're going to talk about this a little bit during ongoing engagement, where reminder phone calls or reminder texts or whatever it is that you're doing, um, where you're, you're reminding people of their appointment but checking in as well. So 
maintaining that contact and the importance of it. In-person engagement can be, again, that first contact, first meetings, and then ongoing contact. Um, underneath this, we have uh, considerations for each of these phases, but they are also uh, interchangeable. So, for example, motivational interviewing is really important in the first few contacts, but so is trauma-informed care, and so is action steps and ropes and discharge planning. We think about the first meeting, uh, when you think about treatment planning, that it's really discharge planning. So this is our process, um, and we invite you to really, you know, print this out or just refer to it as often as you need. The point is that every Every box here is an opportunity for engagement. I want to just check with you all um, around the most difficult phase of engagement for you and your organization. So, so if you could answer the poll, would you say it's the very first contact, the first meetings, or ongoing engagement? Where would you say is the most difficult phase of engagement for you and your organization? That first phone contact, that first contact, so if somebody made a phone call and came in or um, they came and said they want to make an appointment. Did they come back? Those first meetings or ongoing engagement? A, B, or C? We'll just wait one second for everyone to answer. Okay. Most difficult phase of engagement for you and your organization. Let's see our results here. I really wish we had music during these moments. Okay. So the majority of you are saying ongoing engagement. Okay, great. Well, we really hope you get something out of today's webinar, and uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, regardless if it works or it doesn't. Please please keep in touch with us. So four phases of the engagement process. So we're breaking it down for you right now. Um, here they are, the first contact, first meetings, ongoing services, and terminating services, similar to that uh, diagram I showed you a few seconds ago. I want to just summarize the phase one that we talked about in our last webinar, engagement at first contact. So again, we're thinking of that that first contact is that for that phone call or people just coming in, and those objectives are be welcoming, validate the person, expressing empathy and understanding. Really, really important to assess for urgency. How urgent is this meeting? And clarifying the need. Then, of course, confirming the next appointment and problem solving any present presenting barriers. Okay. So this is what we talked about and how important it was, you know, not only to assess for urgency, how important is it that we see you, how fast do we need to see you, but really clarify the need. So why are you here? How can we help you? We gave you some uh, guidelines as well that are posted on our website, ctacny.com, that you can always refer to. I want to just chat in quickly. Do you have any questions from our last webinar if you were able to participate? And also, did anyone make any changes in their first contact since the last webinar? So we talked about uh, the ACE and, and other ways to uh, really engage our participants from the very, very beginning. We wanted to just check in to see if you made any changes in those first contacts. So if you can chat in in the chat box with us, we'd really appreciate that. Does anybody, do you have any questions from the last webinar? Did you make any changes? And I see that Carrie's wondering if she sh if there are slides. You should be seeing slides, Carrie. Brianna will check in with you. Did you participate in our last webinar? If so, uh, did you make any changes? If not, that's okay. We're going to go on. I don't see any responses here. So we're going to talk about phase two, engagement at the first meetings, and Ruth is going to talk with you about this. I don't see the list of panelists. Do you see that? Or just let me know when I've got control. You have control now. And I just want to check in really quickly. Somebody said they changed their first contact to focus more on the goals and presenting needs. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's wonderful, Christy. 
Great. We've changed okay. our, our – somebody else said um, no show for psychological. Reached out after two no shows. Clarify the need. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Okay, Ruth is going to talk to you about the engagement at first meetings. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Tara. Um, you know, the first meeting is critical for both the provider and the participant. Uh, sometimes we think it's just critical for them, but it's critical for, for everyone involved. It's really our role to assist the person who's sitting in front of us to help them achieve their goals and to be well. Now, in order to do this, we must be clear with them about our time together and the path we're going to take together towards wellness. We must also remember that when people first come to us, they are really at their weakest. And it's, it's almost incumbent upon us to actively work to instill hope and strength in them and to help them foster resiliency. Sometimes this can really be a tall order when people are really, really not well. But people need to borrow and feed off of our optimism until um, they have the wherewithal to build it within themselves. When people first come to us, there's an identified need and a motivation. However slight, they got them there. They're there. They're sitting in front of us. And our role is to set the stage. And we do this by using the ARC principles. And this is really a wonderful way for us to, to remember um, our role, our, respons our responsibility in this relationship, to accept the person who's sitting in front of us, to respect them, to respect their experiences, and where they are currently um, in, the, in, in their experiences. And to have curiosity and to get to know who this person is and where they came from and where they want to go. And above all, through all of our interactions, we should do it with complete interest and with complete honesty. And by using the ARC principles, we hope to fully engage with the participants so that they can be in charge of their own treatment. During our first meeting, we need to address immediate concerns, like Kara said a moment ago. Depending on their life experiences, they may need to see you sooner than one week out. Uh, be prepared to assist them with concrete barriers, uh, perceptual barriers. This is really an opportunity for us to engage and to help them with something that they consider very important, and that is a barrier towards treatment. The first meeting is also a perfect opportunity to find out why they're there. Why did they come? What's that felt need? And this reduces the, the possibility of our placing our own judgment as to why we think that they're there. Our goal is to empower people and to clarify our roles and to clarify the treatment path. By doing those clear steps, we help to empower people with information. Many times their previous experiences with providers um, didn't lead them to believe that they are the primary decision maker in this relationship. And so it's really important for us to help um, to work hard to make sure that that is the message that we're sending to them. Empowerment and control over oneself will naturally lend, oh, I'm sorry, let me advance the slide. Um, empowerment and control over oneself and over this process will naturally create an engaged relationship. And by us keeping the ARC principles in mind in all of our interactions with the people that we work with, it really will help set the foundation of a collaborative relationship. Uh, discussions begin in any natural relationship as you and I. And through this process of working together, those discussions will transform and, and change to us and to we. We are a team and we're in this together and um, they will really be able to become much more engaged when they feel that, that we are helping to evoke that change. And that's not something that's particularly easy. And sometimes, as we indicated, participants really need to borrow our hope and borrow our strength until they're strong enough to take it on themselves. And then for us to be able to point it out when they do because they need to be validated. When people first come to us, they're usually at their lowest validate who they are and where they want to go, and all the while lend them your hope and lend them your strength. We all know that people come to us with a variety of experiences within the mental health system. 
now while we can't change the past, it really is critical for us to hear what has worked for them and what is not. Explore the barriers together and solve them together. During the uh, February 2nd webinar, Kara did a wonderful job of discussing the clinic environment and some potential barriers. I'd like for you to also examine your office space. Is it open? Is it inviting? Is it welcoming? Are you sitting behind the desk or are you sitting next to the person you're working with? Your practice of the ARC principles along with some thought into the environment can really go a long way to help engage people and provide them with the comfort that they need to be open, engaged, and to be able to ask questions. Can you pass this to Yvette, please? Thank you, Ruth. Um, just give a second for the slides to come up. Perfect. So, so we're going to continue to look at engagement. Again, as Kara mentioned, there's several parts to engagement. I think some of the important pieces to know is that engagement is not something that happens in the first session um, and then you kind of move past. It really is an ongoing process and actually happens every time you connect um, with individuals. And that's important to know because it's a process that, again, it's relationship building and it's something that you have to continually work at um, and assess to make sure that you are um, aligned with the individual as you're moving forward. <clears throat> so when we talk about ongoing engagement, you know, here are some of the objectives uh, when we're working with individuals. We want to validate and identify strengths, and that is such a critical, critical piece to working with individuals. Uh, as Ruth mentioned, understanding, you know, the history, what they, where they came from, you know, what has been successful for them, but being able to tap into that and help them understand that that's actually going to aid them in the process of um, improving is, is essential. We want to express empathy and understanding. We work with a lot of um, different clientele. Some of them have very colored past. Some of them have struggled tremendously. And so we want to, uh, we want to be able to understand that for them and, and not pass judgment um, because of their current situation. I always say to individuals that I work with, you know, perhaps it, 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 perhaps if you thought about it from a perspective of, you know, if that were your experience, where would you be um, and, and how far would you have come? Just to really uh, begin to empathize and, and have some empathy in working with clients. Uh, that does that mean that, you know, we won't challenge them in their recovery, um, but it, it, it just allows us to work with them in a more strength-based and positive fashion. You always want to encourage shared decision making um, because that allows the participant or individual to buy in, you know, and this is really done by understanding where they've come from, understanding what's important to them and what they would like to work on, and then, you know, putting your heads together to figure out how to make that happen collectively. Um, and, I, and I think that's important because you want them to be an active participant and, and knowing that sometimes um, they may not be able to engage 100% when they come in the door, but that's uh, a, a pathway that you're going to build with them. Uh, build hope and foster resilience. So, so important. Um, I, you know, anyone would be challenged if every time they um, encountered a service provider that all they spoke about was their deficits and all they spoke about was what they uh, had done wrong to date. And, and so that is really discouraging. So again, if you're, if you're building off of strength, um, you really want to spend that in a positive fashion. Um, you want to continue to problem solve around concrete and perceptual barriers. Again, this is not something you do session one, you will have to continuously do this and things will come up. And you want to help um, the individual be a little proactive about what, what do they foresee as any problems or barriers um, that would come up during the time that they're working with you and really try to get ahead of it. And then give them an option should that barrier arise. So, you know, if child care looks like that's going to be an issue, when the issue comes up, it's like, how are we going to deal with it? How are you going to communicate with me that that's an issue? And how am I going to assist you in problem solving that? Let's just talk about why, why is engagement so important? What is the importance of retaining participants? And so here's just some facts around that. Um, despite dropping out of service, participants um, that do so often require further services but they're less likely to seek providers' help in, in the future. 
Um, so if they've had a bad experience, we know that two things. They'll go out and tell their friends that they had a, they did not have a good experience uh, with your agency, but they but they will also be individuals who kind of um, I, I consider them falling through the cracks, right? Not getting the services that they need at the right time, and perhaps that would make um, their recovery even more difficult. Um, getting participants to initially engage is good, but it's not sufficient enough to produce change. Um, and I think that's an important piece. And again, this is something that uh, as a provider, you have to continually work at, right? You have to um, engage with them, but then you also have to understand from their perspective what they're trying to achieve and make a plan that is suitable to their needs. So what are some of the uh, best practices to decrease kind of no-show rates? Um, this, this is a particular interesting slide because one of the pieces that I'd like to point out is these concepts seem very basic. Um, but however, you know, I know through my work in the field that sometimes there, it's very difficult to continuously do this and do this in a way that promotes um, change among individuals. And so um, I always say that this is a it's, a, it's really a new way of working with, your, with individuals. And it's a way that you have to really um, work to ingrain in yourself and really change your perception around what your relationship looks like um, when you're doing this type of work. So on the right side of the um, slide, you see this is what I call the collaboration model. So what are all of the elements um, in collaborating with individuals and families? And what does that look like? Um, and so I think, again, the foundational piece of that is building a trusting relationship with participants. A provider needs to establish trust by acknowledging the power dynamics that have um, generally existed um, in the uh, traditional service delivery models with providers having control. And so don't be surprised if when you're working with individuals, they're really slow to kind of, you know, offer feedback because historically that may not have been in their experience. And so that is something that you will have to cultivate um, with them and let them know that that's okay because they are coming from traditional models where providers uh, generally have been the ones kind of manning the ship and letting them know what they need to, need to do. Um, providers must be transformed from the dominant provider to, to the role of a coach or a mentor, which is helping individuals to develop skills and grow. And so if you see the, the arrows at the bottom, um, you know, the expert is kind of what we're moving from. That That is traditional. And while we have expert knowledge and, 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 and some skills building and all of that stuff, we really want to move to um, kind of sharing that with the individual and kind of coaching them through that process. So really our role shift, right, um, from being the dominant person to, be the, to being a facilitator. Uh, we want to inform participants of the cost-benefit analysis of partnering with you to meet their goals, all right? So you want to give them information to make informed decisions and choices. So you want to tell them, how long do you expect them to have to come to you? You know, is that 10 weeks? Is that 12 weeks? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Um, you want them, you want to tell them, you know, what what is the modality that you plan to use with them while they're in therapy? And also, what is going to be your role in that? How are you going to assist them and how are you going to help them? Um, this is really important because what it does is allows the participant to make an informed decision as to whether or not the plan that you are putting in for them, again, based on, the, based on your education and training, is realistic and feasible, right? Are they able to meet the expectations of the plan? And so we move again from information just being documented as part of a record to it being shared with participants and allowing them to have choice and decisions and all of that. Talk about treatment negotiation. You want to negotiate an agreement on the nature of, of the problem and the manner in which it will be addressed. Again, that kind of goes back to giving them the information, allowing them to negotiate around what's going to work for them, right? So best practice may be that if I'm treating, you know, ADHD, best practice may be that they come 12 weeks for a parent session, you know, an hour each week. But perhaps for some individuals or some families, that's not realistic. They can't do that. Okay. 
great. Then how many weeks can you come? How often can you come? And so I kind of go from the perspective that I'd rather offer that with the hopes that situations might change and I might be able to build it some time in the future than to not have the client um, or have the individual arrive and offer no, no assistance. So really negotiating with them. And really that's a collaborative style. So we move from the professional having all the autonomy about the treatment services that are going to be offered to, um, to the individual participants having choices about what they're able to do. And we talk about empowerment. Um, our, our goal is to incorporate individuals, uh, you know, preferences into therapy and instill general hope about the process. You know, move from being deficit focus, again, what they have continuously done wrong all the time, to more strength-based, and then using those strengths to capitalize on how they can make gains towards goals that they aspire to reach. Um, and, I, and again, I think that's really important for um, building the relationship, building the trust element with participants, and to have them engage such that they really do benefit from treatment, that they're active participants, and that they arrive when expected. And if they can't arrive or don't arrive, that you have some understanding as to what's going on and you can work um, to mitigate, mitigate that barrier so that they can um, continue their treatment. And next we're just gonna move on to Jason who's gonna share with you um, ropes, which is also uh, what could be considered in working with individuals. Right, so thank you, Yvette. Um, and we wanted to introduce ropes to you because it's not only a way to structure sessions, but it's a way to really engage the participants within your organizations. So ROPE stands for Review, Overview, Presentation, Exercise, and Summary. And it's not only a plan for clinicians, but it also helps participants know what to expect during each session. Um, it involves five components that are spread throughout the beginning, middle, and end of each session, starting with the review and the overview. So in the beginning, you have the review, which is really a, which is really a opportunity to go over what happened during the last session. Perhaps there were action steps that the participant wanted to work on. Maybe there were some issues from the week prior that they wanted to discuss. And it's really an opportunity to check in with the participant. Next is the overview, which is a general discussion of the agenda for that particular session. And it's an opportunity for you and the participant to collaborate on what items need to be discussed, what's of importance, and how you can move forward together. Next, during the middle of the session comes the presentation and the exercise. So during the presentation, um, this is where the provider does some psychoeducation, the participant and the provider discuss areas of improvement, and they work through the agenda items that were discussed. So perhaps there were some things that came up during the week that the participant wanted to work on, and the provider has an opportunity to help them through that. Next would be the exercise, which is an invitation to participants to continue their learning. So we don't like to call it homework, but it's really an opportunity for them to choose their own kinds of action steps that they want to work on for the following week. Um, and it's really important for them to have their own autonomy in this. So it's important for you to allow them to choose what's going to happen, what they think is important, and how they're going to track that throughout the week, and then get back to you at the end of the week and at the next session. Following that is a summary, and it's really just how you're going to tie everything together and end the session. It's just a quick review of what was discussed, and it's important because it reinforces learning, it assesses the participants' understanding, and gathers feedback for the, from the participants. So we hope that you can utilize this. It's really just a way to plan and structure your sessions, and it's a really effective tool to engage participants. And now we're just going to move on to the case study, which we first introduced to you last week during the last webinar. 
Great. Th thanks so much, Ruth and Yvette and Jason. And I, I hope that you all really took something from uh, both what Ruth had to say around the first meetings as well as Yvette around ongoing engagement. I think what they really highlighted was a continuation of really aligning with participants, really uh, understanding their felt need and why they're in for treatment, validating, empowering, and building on strengths is so important as we continue to engage with our participants. We're going to uh, follow up with our past case study where we had uh, Jason and Ruth, and Jason is a participant that is hoping to join services with Ruth at the time of our last um, role play, and he had missed a few appointments, and so we Ruth had called him on the phone to talk him through his participation. Since then, Jason has participated in one session, and now he is back for his second session. Um, so as a reminder, Jason is a 28-year-old man presenting with substance abuse issues and depression. He's currently unemployed and looking for work. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to get the slides up. He's missed his first two appointments. Uh, he called to reschedule because he was feeling under the weather, and then he forgot to show for the follow-up. Jason lives about 20 miles away and usually uses his cousin's car whenever he can, so getting to the appointment is somewhat of a challenge. Otherwise, he would have to take a bus and a train to get to the clinic. He also has a responsibility for his four-year-old son, um, who he shares custody with. And so this role play is going to be about Jason coming in for a second session with Ruth. Um, we're going to hear their role play, and then we're going to ask for feedback. So thanks, Ruth and Jason. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Thank you so much for coming in today. Hi, good morning, Ruth. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Um, it's no problem. Thank you for meeting with me. Sure. I know it's not easy for you sometimes to make it in, and I'm just so happy that you're here today with me. No, yeah, it's 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 been a struggle. As you know, I have to watch my son, and, uh, you know, the clinic is quite far, so transportation has been an okay. issue. Yeah. So how are you feeling today? Um, you know, I'm I'm okay. I uh you know, to be honest, I'm I'm a little annoyed. I um I didn't feel good after our last session. I, I felt that, you know, it was just a bunch of questions and over and over again about my past and you know, I've I've been through that before when I when I tried therapy before. Um and it, it didn't go anywhere. I just felt like you're asking a bunch of questions but you don't really care about what's going on. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, first of all, I, I'm so sorry. It's not my intention to to um, really make you not not um, enjoy our time together. What, but I can so clearly understand where you're coming from and all those questions. And I, we often feel the same way. You know, we're sitting at at the table next to you and we're asking all these questions, and they're really designed to help us to get to know you. And sometimes it would be better for us to ask all those questions over the, you know, course of time. Uh, but sometimes it's just really important for us to get to know you right away and why you've come to us and why you're not feeling well so that we could um, do our best to, to help you out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, just, I, don't I just don't want to. Go ahead. I just don't want to waste my time. I um I want to know that this is going somewhere, and it yeah. just seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. Okay, so so let's make sure that it goes somewhere because I don't want you not to be engaged with us and, and then leave and then sort of not feel well again and end up looking for another therapist. Let, let's work together and let's, let's build our relationship and let's get you well. Now, I can tell you all of those questions really did lead us to a wonderful place right now because I really feel today I know you a lot better than I did last time. And the more we get together, the more uh, we will get to know each other and we will understand and and work together to help you feel better. Okay. I mean, that, that all sounds good. I just, I guess I have to have to see it happening. I have to Absolutely. really feel it happening. Yeah. Um, oh, and yeah. as I said, you know, it's hard to get down here. I have to watch my son um, and scheduling. I just, I really don't know how many times I can come here and if I could really commit to it each week. Well, you know what? Um, I think one of the things that we should do is just to 
be real. I mean, you've got responsibilities. You've got a life. And one of the things we talked about last time was that treatment should not become your life. You know, it's a part of fitting it into your life so that you can overall no longer need it and, and be well. And so let's talk about what this trip, what this journey of ours is going to look like together. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is what our sessions would look like. And if you see right here on my wall, it says ropes with a little knot next, next to it. And the R-O-P-E-S really does stand for, um, it's, a, it's an acronym, Review, Overview, Presentation, Exercise, and Summary. We could go through all of that together. And it's essentially letting you know what will happen during during this time together so that you don't feel like you're wasting your time because I don't want you to waste your time. Okay. Okay. I mean, that sounds good. So what does all of that mean? In the review, it's basically the very beginning of every single session. It's not just, hey, how are you, and, and the pleasantries that we all give each other, but it's really checking in. How was the last week or the last two weeks since we've seen each other? Did you work on anything during that time? Did anything go, go wonderful? Did anything not go so wonderful? Did you experience some challenges? And that's what we're really going to talk about. How was that last week? And then we're going to say, all right, talking about that, let's talk about also what we want to talk about today based on all of that information that you just shared. And then that's where the bulk of our session really takes place. Let's talk about the things that happen and how we can improve upon them and take some action steps so that when things like this happen again, you've got different strategies. Or if things went well, you can um, improve on the same strategies that you used before. Mm -hmm. And then that, the E stands for exercise, and that really is an opportunity just to apply the learning in between sessions. So you did something really, really great with, with your kid and you really felt good, and, and then how do you make sure that you keep doing that? Or you do similar things so that you feel good, your kid feels good, other people in your life, and things are going really well. And then the S stands for summary, and this is your opportunity to be really, really frank, just like you were with me today. How did things go? How did I do? How did we do together? How, how can our next session be even um, better for you? There's something that I did that you didn't like. This is a wonderful opportunity every single time we're together for us to just take a look at this relationship and say, we did great, wonderful session, a lot happened. Or, you know, a lot did happen, but Bruce, you did something that just made me feel uncomfortable and, and what have you. It's a wonderful opportunity to do that. Okay. I mean, I mean that. A, oh, sorry. Go on. I was just going to say, you know, and I know the review, the rope sounds like a lot, but we're going to do this together, and I'm here, and we're going to be doing this together every step of the way. Okay. I um no, it it does sound like a lot, but I I'm glad that there's some kind of plan in place. Um, and you know, I I think maybe we should just try it. Uh try it for a few times and, and see how it goes. Yeah, and, and I want you to know that I'm here for you. And so if your schedule changes, as we all know that it will because you've got such such um, responsibilities that I think maybe you and I can be in touch before the session and then just like the day before, mm -hmm. if that's okay with you, and then just say, hey, is tomorrow still going to work for you? Or should we make another arrangement? Okay, thank you. No, I, that that makes a lot of sense. So would you call me? Uh, yes. Is that okay with you? No, that would be perfect because I, I don't want to just not be able to make it. But um, if you call me and, you know, even remind me or ask me if that works, um, that'll be better for me. Okay. That sounds like a plan then. All so right, thank you. How did we do today, Jason? Um, you know, it's it's a lot. I'm I'm glad that I was able to uh just let you know how I felt about the last time. Um as I said, I, I don't want to waste time, but it it, it sounds like it, this is going somewhere. So, um I think it was okay for today and uh we'll see how it goes next time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruth and Jason. Thank you. That was a wonderful role play. Um, we really appreciate you kind of working through the process of the, the first few meetings and also retaining Jason as your participant in ways you can work with him uh, around some of those barriers. So I want to just check in with you all, the audience. How did you feel about that? What did you think about the role play? Did you like it? What would you have done differently? Give us some feedback. And then we're going to go through some resources together. So share with us about your thoughts. Share with, share with us your thoughts, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you would have done differently. Yeah, I, I I definitely liked that Ruth um, explained the process to Jason. As you could see, he was really struggling with whether or not it was doable, or and that that was because he didn't have a clear context into what the expectation was. And I think Ruth was able to do a great job in explaining to him, you know, how how she envisioned their work together and how she could work with him and negotiate with him. And so you heard her say, like, you know, I'm going to give you a call to see if this you know, time still works for you. I'm going to check in with you and because I know you got a lot of responsibilities and that might be difficult. And so um, I think being able to do that, and as Jason kind of mentioned, like, I, you know, it, it, I think he sensed that Ruth was very um, concerned about his getting the proper treatment. And he said, you know, I, I just don't want to not show up, um, but acknowledging that he was having difficulties. So I, I thought it was a, a great role play to highlight those things. I think one of the things about this particular role play for me is that Jason is is really feeling free to talk and share his frustration. And, you know, you're just another therapist. You're just one in a row, and, you know, I've shared my story on and on. The thing is, not everyone is going to be that open, and they're just not going to show up. And so part of it is intuitive, right? It's not always mm -hmm. just answering um, a direct question. Uh, or a direct concern. It's, it's trying to feel them out. And if we lay out the plan together, whether we think they have a concern or not, just laying out the plan, giving them as much information as possible, really does help to empower them so that they can um, feel comfortable to, to be able to share what they're thinking and feeling. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Ruth and Yvette, for your feedback. We did get some feedback from you all, the audience. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Carrie felt that she was validating, that Ruth was validating and connected with the positive side of things. However, some of the staff she's with thought that you spoke, Ruth, a lot and felt um, that it was too educational of an intervention. Any thoughts around that, Ruth? I agree with them. <laughs> I said to myself during the role play, oh, I'm really talking too much, and it would be much easier if, if uh -huh. Jason were right in front of me, you know, we're not in the same office during during this webinar. So they're absolutely correct. Had had um, we been in the same room together, it, you know, we we would take body language into account, and I'd see that he, you know, he'd want to talk, or I I wouldn't keep talking and talking. I'd be more comfortable with the silence. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we we were hoping to put this on a video for you all, but we weren't able to get Ruth and Jason together today. So we hope to do that more in the future, actually. Um, and Carol, can, also, Carol, can I be sure? I'm yep. sorry. I just wanted to comment on one thing. I think um, I think we have to be um, just aware that all those, you know, it, it looked like Ruth had given him a lot of information that sometimes we're erring on the other side of not giving enough information. And so there's a happy medium. You know, again, the, people need to be informed of what the expectations are so that, again, they can make an informed choice. So, you know, Jason came across as very educated, you know, we probably could have put in a little more plain language, but I just don't want people to think that's still very important to let folks know what the expectations are so they can make informed choices and decisions. Thank you so much, That I was going to say something similar, so I'm glad that you, you said that. Thanks so much. Isabel said that uh, she thought the role play was good, that the client or participant, Jason, was receptive. Um, do you think your your participants would be receptive to, to Ruth in this way? Do you think that you um, explain things enough or not enough? Chat in with us about that. Why you do that, Victor said that uh, he thinks allowing 
participants to talk and not rushing to fill in protocols allow for open and trustful engagement. And I completely agree, Victor. I think that's really one of the things that Ruth is trying to uh, portray here, that those those questions, sometimes the, the protocol and asking all the questions, sometimes it's not as engaging as it could be. Some of those questions can wait. And I think that's what Jason was trying to tell Ruth as well. Brandon likes that Ruth remained flexible. Lisa said that she liked the fact that Ruth asked the client, how did we do? More staff feedback, wanted clients, wanted participants to have more feedback on what he would have liked to be different from the session. So to expand that conversation a bit, great. Mm -hmm. Kevin liked how Ruth handled the questions that, she, that you needed to ask. Um, Concerning the work makes the visits a little, uh, sometimes those questions make visits a little impersonal, so how to personalize those questions. Cheryl said less talking by Ruth would be helpful, um, asking what do you want, what do you need, especially around transportation, child care, find this, uh, to find the session useful. How does the, how does the, the, how do you Ruth know what he wants? Any thoughts around that? I think a lot of the concrete stuff we really did address back in early February regarding the child care and the flexibility and when he had mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. vehicle available. And so I was just trying to move beyond that, having already known that. Yeah, that's pretty much what you did in the first web, in the first uh, role play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, Cheryl said letting people tell you what they want before um, we tell them what they will get from the program. Yeah, so uh, Cheryl, this is something we really recommend that happens in that very first contact. And I agree that checking in around this is really helpful. It's also helpful to let people know exactly what treatment is gonna look like. So that's, I think, also what Ruth was portraying. Any other thoughts? Thank you, you all are wonderful. Thank you so much for chatting in with us. Any other thoughts or questions for Ruth or Jason? Okay, we're gonna go on. We, as I mentioned, we have a bunch of resources for you. I wanted to start with something called the Treatment Planner. Uh, this is something that we have created for you. This is called the Collaborative Treatment Planner. It's a decision-making guide. It's really just conceptualizing treatment from the very beginning to the end. So knowing that our participants aren't gonna be with us their entire life, that there is a beginning of treatment, there's a middle of treatment, and then the, there's an end of treatment. And to keep in mind what these other stressors are, so that you have a focus, what's the primary, primary diagnosis or target, what are some goals and objectives around that, then what you're gonna do in the beginning, so engagement really should happen in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, um, but what are some of those other skills that you're gonna use? Are you gonna use an intervention? Are you, are you gonna use um, something else to really help your, your participant, whether they have um, anxiety or depression or whatever the diagnosis is, that you're gonna maintain a focus on that and have a plan from the beginning through the end of treatment, but also keeping in mind these other stressors. So are there other stressors such as relationship difficulties? Is Jason having a hard time with his partner around sharing custody? Those would be some other stressors. And then what's really needed for discharge criteria? So this is something that you can begin to use. We don't wanna to add to the, your burden and the paperwork that you already have to do, but we've gotten a lot of good feedback from other people we've used this with that it's really helpful to just think about treatment with your participants from the very beginning all the way through the end. So this is what we call our treatment planner um, or our discharge planner, which is also uh, how we were thinking about it. We also have our session planner so that you can think about the session in the same way, the ropes, as Ruth and Jason uh, explained to you, but then Ruth also explained to Jason in the role play, the session planner, thinking about the beginning of the session, the middle of the session, and the end of the session. Uh, this is something that you can also use and, and then write any notes if you if you would like. I wanted to point out our guidelines for ongoing engagement. From our last webinar for the first contacts, we had guidelines as well, and those are on our website. And these are our guidelines for ongoing contact, which is what you heard Ruth and Yvette talk about. To validate and identify strengths, build hope and foster resilience, how important it is, problem solve, how we're constantly problem solving with participants while expressing empathy and encourage that shared decision making. And of course, get, oh sorry, and of course getting client feedback. So getting feedback from participants. And then the other side of this is for termination. We're not talking about a lot about termination, um, only because we know that, you know, with 
participants showing up for treatment, sometimes they self-terminate. So we're focusing on these, these moments before termination in our time together. So I also wanted to show you a few other things. So that was the session planner. We have a session feedback form. This is something that we got from, we uh, created from Scott Miller. We have an article of his on our website as well from our last uh, training, our, our webinar on February 2nd. This is a session feedback form. This is essentially what Ruth did. Um, you can use a form like this or you can make it really informal as the way Ruth did. So how did we do today? What did you like? Or you can make it pretty formal and you could say, listen, you know what, Jason, I'm going to ask you to fill this out after every session so that we can kind of keep track of our sessions together. You know, was it helpful? Did you feel like I listened to you? Did you feel like we're focusing on the treatment together? Do you feel like, uh, do you feel more prepared to handle your problems? So that you can really check in around um, how Jason is doing how and how treatment is going with him. What's the best thing about today's session? What would you have changed about the session? So I think I talked last time about creating a culture feedback so that you are creating a culture feedback with participants, but also supervisors and, and clinicians have a, also have a culture feedback within their organization. It's so important. And then we have our action step planner and goal attainment. So there's a lot of literature that says, and Ruth was, and Jason mentioned this as well, how important it is to have practices between sessions. So it's not only what you talk about in the session that's so important, it's that practicing in between sessions that's also equally important. So we created something called the Action Step Planner. The top of it is the Action Step Planning. I will take the following step. I will do this action step by, so in, by a date. Who will help me do this? What many steps I will take to do this action action step. So there are three op, three uh, fill, in, fill in the blanks here. So many step one. What many step will I do to do this action step? When will I take the mini step? And where will I take the mini step? So just breaking down that process around. You know what? If Jason uh, really wants to work on getting to therapy every week, he could make that an action step and think about that and what he'll do and how he'll think about getting there on time or, or getting there, maybe borrowing a car ahead of time, all of those things that he could think about if that was one of his goals. But of course, he would create the goal, not, not uh, ourselves as the providers. And then I achieve my goal. So how would you reward yourself? So it's kind of split in half. You could fold it in half so the participants can carry it around with them in between sessions and think about what their action step for the week or for the month or however long they want to think about that. And then we have, we're going to talk about CQI really quickly. Yvette's going to talk about this with you. Then we'll wrap up. Yeah, so, so let's talk about how it is that you, um, you know, try to garner feedback from participants and really use that feedback to improve the process, improve your work, improve your program. This can go for, um, for a lot of different things, but we use the plan, do, check, act cycle. Um, and when we talk about plan, we're focusing on what is, what is the problem? You know, what have you identified as needing um, some action step? And you've got to determine the goal. What are you trying to achieve? Um, and then doing, and that's actually putting the plan in place, execution, trying it out, um, and then checking and studying and assess your progress. Um, look at your actual versus your target. You know, is, are you headed in the right direction? Is there some mid-course correction that you need to make in order to reach your target? And then um, act, which is just standardize if it worked and reevaluate and make adjustments if it, if it doesn't. And so this is a great way. Um, that you can really work with participants to see if, you know, if some of the treatment modalities that you're doing is working and help them kind of learn that process of offering the feedback, plan, do, check, and act, and that's really to improve um, your work with them. And again, it could cut across many different elements, programs, um, and, and, and so you always have to be thinking about this and always be um, in tune to this. Thanks, Yvette. Thanks so much. So really thinking about your process and making little changes and, and trying them out and then seeing how they go. 
Um, I did want to mention, though, before we go about stall treatment and some possible problems. So, you know, it's great if we can engage and everybody participates and then they keep coming to all of our sessions, but the reality is that's not always the case. So sometimes treatment is stalled. So we wanted to just look really quickly uh, around possible problems. So is the problem the diagnosis? It could be, have we assessed the problem correctly? Do we have the complete picture? Have we fully assessed the strengths of the participant? And have we fully assessed and addressed those practical barriers that often get in the way of the treatment process? Another possible problem is the practitioner-participant misalignment. So what has the engagement process been like? Is there a discrepancy between what the participant wants and what the clinician wants? Sometimes that happens. And if that happens, that could lead to stalled treatment. Are there cultural values, beliefs, and preferences that have not been taken into account? Some other possible problems are dosage and duration. For example, attendance and progress tracking, were there missed appointments? Was there a lack of those action plans and homework in between sessions? Was the order of intervention uh, kind of out of place? How was the fidelity to the intervention? So really thinking about um, these possible problems if you have any kind of stalled treatment with your participants. And then we have possible solutions. So really reviewing that diagnosis thoroughly, how was it made, who was involved in contributing to the diagnosis. So maybe uh, Jason has presented with substance abuse, and that may be what's going on with him, but he may also have underlying depression, which isn't uncommon, right? He may have anxiety, so maybe it's going to help to really attend to that depression and anxiety. Review the core clinical problems that's been the focus of treatment. How was this determined? Review the interventions and approaches. So these are all possible solutions that you can use. We can use a treatment planner. We have a progress tracker we're going to talk about at our, in our sustainability webinar. We have the session planner. All of these are really great uh, to use if you have any stalled treatment and to use these with your participants. Communicate with participants and get feedback. It's also important to get that feedback. If you're getting that feedback after every session, how did we do today? What did you think about today's session? What would you like to have done differently? Are we working on your goals? And then, of course, collaboration. All of that is so important to have collaboration because it's all about partnership to reach our goals. That's why you have, we have that image of a goal. <laughs> so these are just a summary of the tools that we provided for you. And the next steps, I just want to check in really quickly. Are there any strategies that you can begin using right away in your organization? If so, please chat them in. Any strategies from today's webinar that you can begin using right away? How confident are you in using them? That was a suggestion from uh, one of the participants in today's webinar that we check in around confidence. So how confident are you in using these? What obstacles may get in the way? So if you can chat, with, uh, chat in with us around anything that you would start to do differently and how confident you are and any obstacles. I don't see any chat, so maybe you all are going to use everything. Most importantly, what I'd love for you to do is just check in with us if you need any help or extra assistance. And this, these are our schedule of next steps. So these are upcoming CTAC events with our webinar series around best engagement practices in adult serving outpatient mental health clinics. So we have a consultation webinar for our learning community only consultation webinar from 11 to 12 on March 16th for the rest of our broader CTAC audience on March 17th. And then we're going to have another consultation webinar on April 6th and April 7th. So bring all your questions and your concerns then. So try out some of these things and come back to us and let us know how it's going. Maybe you, you uh, would like us to help you through some of these things. And that's the point of the consultation webinar. So we're going to check in with you in March and in April. Then we'll have a final web webinar around lessons learned and sustainability where we're going to talk a little bit about progress tracking and ways to continue all of this as you uh, move forward. Um, we do have some feedback now. Thank you, everyone. This session planner seems helpful, so somebody, Elizabeth may start to use that. I think I will use a feedback and action planner, Isabel said. Great. Thank you so much. Kathleen said concerns would be in our agency caseload sizes. We uh, could see using some of these, but time might prevent using more. Absolutely. Time is always a barrier, right? Time and constraints. I, I completely understand, but as, as Yvette had said, you know, start small. Start with something small, see how it works, and then if that works for you, then you could start to make other changes if you feel the need. Great. 
All right, thank you so much, everyone. We really uh, appreciated you spending time with us today, and we enjoyed our time with you as well. This is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us. And most importantly, have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.